Located in the Roman province of Asia, the city of Ephesus was filled with pagan idolatry and the worship of the goddess Diana. On his third missionary journey, Paul returned to Ephesus where he lived for two years. His mission, according to the book of Acts, was that all who dwelt in Asia would hear the word of the Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome to Through the Bible. I'm your host, Steve Schwetz, and today our teacher, Dr. J. Vernon McGee, continues his introduction to Paul's epistle to the Ephesians. So grab your copy of God's Word and hop aboard the Bible bus as we set out for Ephesians chapter 1, verse 1. And while you find your seat, let's share some letters from our mailbag. First is an email. This is from Dave in Roseville, Michigan. I took my first trip through the Bible from 1994 to 1999. I recently hopped back on board in 2 Corinthians for another five-year journey. The program is aired here five times a day, so I'm able to catch it every day and not miss. I find it fascinating that it's been more than 30 years since Dr. McGee has gone home to be with the Lord, and yet this ministry continues to point lost souls to Jesus. I find your programs are a great way to keep me reading my Bible. No longer does it sit on my shelf, but now I'm in the Word daily. I am also a member of the World Prayer Team. May God continue to bless His Word and bless through the Bible. Well, it's certainly great to hear from you, Dave, and we're glad that you're back aboard with us, and we're also glad that you partner with us on the World Prayer Team. And then here's a note. This is another one from a World Prayer Team member. Her name is Anne, and she lives in Ontario, Canada. My husband and I have been listening to Through the Bible for almost three years now. Each morning we sit down with our breakfast and coffee and listen. What an amazing way to start our day. We're so encouraged and blessed by each message. Thank you also for the World Prayer Today emails. It's a privilege to pray for people all over the world. Listening to the letters from other listeners who are coming to Christ through this teaching is so exciting. Thank you for allowing us to partner with you by putting more fuel in the Bible bus tank so more people can be reached. We recently bought my 84-year-old parents the Solar Bible Bus. They have no Internet, and their local radio stations don't carry the program. It's been an absolute joy to hear them talk about how much they are learning from the truths of these broadcasts. They eagerly look forward to the next message, and sometimes they listen to three messages in a row. We tell all our friends and family about the teaching and encourage them to listen. We also pray our prodigal son, who's still living at home, will begin to listen and develop a new love for God's Word. Thank you for your continued faithfulness in getting out the Word. Well, certainly thanks for your note, Anne, and I pray that your son begins to listen with you as well. And then here's a note. This is from a fellow passenger named Shirley. I'm always amazed at how God still uses Dr. McGee long after his passing. I thank him that he does. I'm so grateful to God for preserving these lessons and providing such faithful staff to send the messages out to so many countries in so many languages and dialects. It's a pleasure that God has enabled me to be a monthly contributor to keeping the fuel tank filled for the journey to distant lands. I'm excited to one day meet all the staff and all the other Bible bus passengers. I'll keep praying with the World Prayer Team and may God bless you all until the day that we meet in heaven. Well, amen to that, Shirley. That's a day that I'm looking forward to as well. Your prayers and your generous donations do help keep the Bible bus rolling in your community and in more than 120 languages and dialects around the world. Just think of the impact you're having. Our last email is from Karen in Fayetteville, North Carolina. I've been newly diagnosed with a disease for which there is no cure. I praise God for each day that he allows me to see. I experience a feeling of confidence in my salvation every day I listen to Dr. McGee. To be able to tell others about Jesus is a blessing in itself. And to know that others are doing the same all over the world is exciting. To be a part of the World Prayer Team means so much to me. Well, thank you, Karen. Thank you for inspiring all of us today. And may God bless you as you study his word and pray for others. You know, if you'd like to join me, Karen, Shirley, Ann, and Dave as we travel the world on our knees, praying for God's whole word to reach his whole world, 
Why don't you sign up for the World Prayer Team today at ttb.org forward slash pray. As a member, you'll receive a daily email with prayer prompts and stories of how God's Word is changing lives all over the world. Again, that address is ttb.org forward slash pray. I typically read my email first thing in the morning, and it's a great way to set my perspective for the rest of the day. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your Word that changes lives, including our own. As we study today, please speak to our hearts and help us to know you better and want to obey and serve you more. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Here's Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Now, friends, last time all I did was put out an introduction to this wonderful epistle to the Ephesians. And I do not regret spending all the time in an introduction because of the fact that this epistle is one of the most important and we need the background. As I said last time, I had the privilege of visiting Ephesus, and it was to me a rich experience. This was a glorious city. It was probably the second most important city in the Roman Empire, only second to Rome in influence. It was a city that had a culture that was largely Greek, at this particular time that Paul was there. The city was founded probably 2000 B.C. by the Hittites. And it was what we would call an Oriental city, Asian city, until about 1000 B.C. and the Greeks came in. And then you have a mixture of East and West. Actually, Kipling is wrong as far as Ephesus is concerned. He said East is East and West is West. And never the twain shall meet. But they did meet in Ephesus. And over this long period of probably 2,500 years, this city was one of the great cities of the world, a cosmopolitan place. It was on a harbor that now is all filled up, silted in. And it's not a harbor anymore. In fact, it's about... 10 kilometers, about 6 miles from the ocean today. But when Paul went there the first time, he sailed right up to that beautiful marble, white marble freeway, if you please, because it was a very wide street, and this beautiful Tarian marble was everywhere. And the quarries of Mount Priam had supplied the marble, and there was the art and the wealth of the Ephesian citizens, and as a result, they had built there one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, which was that vulgar idol of Diana, and it was housed in one of the most beautiful temples ever built, and it was that temple that was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. In it was some of the most wonderful artworks, uh, Kelly's great picture of Alexander the Great, hurling the thunderbolt, was in that. It was the largest Greek temple ever built, four times larger than the Parthenon, and very similar to it. It was 418 feet long by about 239 feet wide. And the columns, over a hundred of the exterior columns, but inside was this vulgar idol of Diana. It was not the beautiful Diana of Greek mythology, but it was actually the Anatolian conception, the goddess of fertility, not the goddess of the moon, but the goddess of fertility, the many-breasted one, and all sorts of gross immorality took place in the shadow of this temple. This was what Paul had to contend against in the party that was with him. But here the gospel was preach with such great power. And as a result, they had a riot in the city. There were those that led a rebellion against Paul because he was putting them out of the business of making these little idols of Diana. And he was preaching a gospel of the living God, that there was life through Jesus Christ. And the believers that turned, there was a great company of them. I think the gospel was more effective in this area than any place and at any time in the history of the world. And there came into existence this Ephesian church. And that church is the highest church spiritually 
I think of any. The epistle to the Ephesians reveal that. To me, the amazing thing is there were people living in that pagan city who understood this epistle. Paul wouldn't have written it to them if they couldn't have understood it. And not only that, you find that in the seven churches of Asia, the first one is Ephesus. And that is a series of churches that give the entire history of the church. And Ephesus was the church at its best, the highest spiritual level. You and I today can't even conceive of the high spiritual level that the Spirit of God had brought these Ephesian believers where they love the person of the Lord Jesus, drawn to him. Oh, today in our churches, and now I hope I won't be misunderstood again because I've been a pastor for years. I have a pastor's heart. I love to minister in our churches today. But we're far from the person of Christ. We're so enamored with a program. We're so enamored with an office. We're so enamored with doing some work in the church. And we're far from the person of Christ. The big question would be, how much really do you love him? Paul's going to tell these Ephesians, Christ loved the church. He gave himself for it. Well, do you return that love? Do you respond to him? Can you say to him, I love him because he first loved me? Well, this letter to the Ephesians ought to bring us very close to Christ. Now, as we come here to this first chapter, the church is a body, the body of Christ in the world today. We're going to see in the first two verses an introduction. Then we'll see God the Father plan the church in verses 3 through 6. Remember the Lord Jesus said, A body hast thou prepared me. And he came to this earth yonder at Bethlehem, given a body, grew up yonder in Nazareth, became a carpenter. And Mary's husband, Joseph, taught Jesus to be a carpenter. And then for three years he ministered, finally died on the cross, shed his blood for you and me. And then we have, in verses 7 through 12, God the Son paid the price for the church. We have redemption through his blood. And then God the Holy Spirit protects the church, verses 13 through 14. By one Spirit are we all baptized into one body. Then you have prayer for knowledge and power. And we need that prayer as we come to this epistle today and let us pray. Lord, we do pray. You'll make real and living this epistle to our hearts. For we pray in Jesus' name. Now here in the introduction as we come, we have the heavenly calling of the church, the vocalization. And we have here the church as a body. And I read the first two verses. Paul an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God to the saints that are at Ephesus, even to the believers in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, you probably, as you followed the text, and I do hope that you have your Bible. Some of you are listening to us today at work. Some of you are riding along the highway, but for goodness sakes, don't try to read it while you're driving. But pull over to the side and just turn that to this text, and you'll find it indeed very helpful. Now, as you follow along, you'll notice I changed some things. And this is, first of all, a brief introduction. And it's brief for several reasons. It's brief because, very frankly, This epistle was directed to the church in Ephesus, but in some of the better manuscripts, an Epheso is left out. It's not there. Which just simply means this, that it was apparently the epistle that Paul referred to when he said in Colossians to read the epistle to the Laodiceans. In other words, this was a circular letter that went around. And I think it was primarily for the church, of course, in Ephesus, but for the churches in that day. And he's not writing here to the local church as much as he is to the church in general. That is the invisible body of believers. We're going to see that Paul 
He says, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Now, I'd like to change that just a little. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus. Why do I say that? And I hope you'll not think I'm splitting hairs here, but he's an apostle of Christ Jesus. Paul, all the way through this epistle and many other places, it should be Christ Jesus. Christ is the title, of course. That's who he is. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus was his human name. Paul could say that we know him no longer after the flesh. Paul didn't know him, the Jesus of the three years' ministry. He says, I met him on the Damascus Road, and he was the glorified Christ. I know him as the glorified Christ. And he emphasized always the name Christ first, Christ Jesus. But he says, I am an apostle. Now, what is an apostle? Well, that's the highest office the church has ever had. No one today is an apostle in the church for the simple reason they can't even meet the requirements. To begin with, the apostles receive their commission directly from the living lips of Jesus. You will find Paul made that claim. He said, I'm an apostle, not by the will of man, but by the will of God. And I'm an apostle that's been made an apostle directly by Jesus Christ. And that's the reason that I believe Paul took the place of Judas and not Mattathias. They voted Mattathias in. I don't find anywhere Jesus Christ making him an apostle. All the apostles apparently received their commission directly from the living lips of the Lord Jesus. Now, the second requirement for an apostle was the apostles saw the Savior after his resurrection. Paul could meet that requirement, as you know. And then the third requirement of an apostle was they exercised a special inspiration. They expounded and wrote Scripture. And certainly Paul measures up to that more than any other. And then the fourth, they exercised supreme authority. The Lord Jesus said actually to them, all powers given unto you. And the badge of their authority was the power to work miracles. And miracles, I think, ceased with the apostles because that was their badge in that day. And John could say before he finished his long ministry, probably at the close of the first century, he could say, if any come to you not having this doctrine, no longer a miracle worker, but not having this doctrine. The doctrine's important today. And then they were given a universal commission to found churches. These are six requirements that an apostle must meet. And Paul certainly met that. Then he says here that he is an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. Paul rested his apostleship upon the will of God rather than any personal ambition or on man or whether the church made him an apostle, but he's an apostle by the will of God. Over in Galatians, the first chapter, verse 15, he says, "...but when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his Son in me that I might preach him among the heathen." so that Paul says, I'm this kind of an apostle, that is, by the will of God. And he said to Timothy, 1 Timothy 1, 12 and 13, And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious. But I obtained mercy, because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. Now, Paul made constant reference to the will of God as the foundation of his apostleship. You'd like to check that. Look at 1 Corinthians 1 1, 2 Corinthians 1 1, Colossians 1 1, 2 Timothy 1 1. In all of these places, Paul says he's an apostle by the will of God. Now he says to the saints in Ephesus, the word for saint is hagios. It actually means 
separated or set aside for the sole use of God. That is, that which belongs to God. For instance, the pots and pans in the tabernacle and later on in the temple, they were called holy vessels. Why? Because they were specially holy, very fine and nice. No, I think they were all beat up and battered after that long wilderness journey, but they were for the use of God. And my friend, a saint is one who's trusted Christ. In fact, there are only two kinds of people today, the saints and the ain'ts. And if you're not a saint, you're an ain't. And if you ain't an ain't, then you're a saint, you see. So that a saint is one who's trusted Christ and he's set aside for the sole use of God. Now, there's some of the saints not being used of God, of course, but that's their fault. They are for the use of God and therefore his service. Therefore, saints should act saintly. It's true, but they're not saints because of the way they act. They're saints because of their position in Christ and they belong to him to be used of him. Then he says in Ephesus, and I've already referred to that, it could be in your town, whatever the name of it is. For me, it could be in Pasadena. And he says, even to the believers. Now, the believers and saints are the same, you see. They are the same people. A saint should be saintly, and a believer should be faithful. But a believer is one who's trusted Christ, and a saint is the same one. Now, the term saint, I think, is the Godward aspect of the Christian. The term believer is the manward aspect of the believer. Now, they're in Christ Jesus. And this is probably the most wonderful thing of all. And this epistle is going to amplify that so much that I will be dwelling on that in more detail later on. But to me, the most important word in the New Testament is the little preposition in, in. Theologians have come up with some lulus trying to tell us what it means to be saved. How do you define our salvation? Well, they've come up with the word redemption, atonement, justification, reconciliation, propitiation, and vicarious substitutionary sacrifice of Christ. And all of those are good. I'm not finding fault with them. I think they're wonderful. But each one of them merely gives one aspect of our salvation— what does it really mean to be saved? To be saved means to be in Christ. We are irrevocably and organically joined to Christ by the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We're put in the body of believers. And we're told, he that's joined unto the Lord is one spirit. We belong to him. And there's nothing as wonderful, therefore, as that. There is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. Can you improve on that? We're in Christ Jesus. That's the great accomplishment of salvation. Dr. Chafer found that it occurred 130 times in the New Testament. How wonderful it is. The Lord Jesus used it. He says, ye in me and I in you. And we're in Christ. Now the bird is in the air, but the air is in the bird. The Lord Jesus said, Ye and me and I and you. I can't explain that. It's so profound. But the fish is in the water, and the water is in the fish. The iron is in the fire, and the fire is in the iron. And the believer is in Christ, and Christ is in the believer. We are joined to him. The head is in the body. The body is in the head. My body can't move without the head directing it. Now, the church, which is his body, is in Christ the head, and all the truths of this epistle of Ephesians revolve around this great fact. Now he begins with his salutation. It's very brief. The reason, I think, is obvious that he couldn't include all the believers. He knew too many of them there. And to begin with, if it was to go to other churches, he just wouldn't want to mention the ones in Ephesus. So he makes his introduction very brief here, and next time we'll see that. Grace to you and peace from God our Father, from the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'd like to close today on that note. May the grace of God and the peace of God 
be with you today, and forever for that matter. If you'd like to know more about what it means to be in Christ, then visit our website, ttb.org, and click on the banner that says, How Can I Know God? There you'll find several downloadable resources that you can listen to and read for free. Again, that address is ttb.org, and then click on the banner that says, How Can I Know God? Or call us at 1-800-65-BIBLE, and we'll send you a couple of these resources by mail. We'll dive deeper into the depths of Ephesians tomorrow. I'm Steve Schwetz, and I hope that you'll join us and invite a friend to hop aboard the Bible bus with you as we continue this wonderful journey through the Bible. Jesus made it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. We're so grateful for the faithful and generous support of Through the Bible's partners who are being used by God to take the whole word to the whole world.